something real quick now that we're in season four. Uh, you'll notice I've kind of stopped using the music and sound in the background stuff. As much as I hate doing that, it, the, everything in me, you know, the editing side of me, the directing side of me, wants there to be some kind of ambient uh, background music in these types of videos where it's just me talking, right? Since I can't actually show you footage, thanks to the th constant threat of copy wrong and the ever-changing dynamic of YouTube, which unfortunately I saw coming and even more unfortunately was right about. So yeah, it's just me talking in front of an animated background. No music, no audio. And you're like, why? Well, funny story. Uh, I bought a song, two songs actually. One song I was using for Voyager, one song I was using for Babylon 5. Purchased those, right? Well, I put out, I forget what, but one of the episodes, just one of them, suddenly got copyright flagged. And I don't mean the usual, hey, this is ours, we own this. It's actually the first real copyright strike I've ever had for the song. And they accurately de de depicted it as like, yes, this song from this company that I bought it from. And I'm like, what? Now, I fought that and overturned it. So, no actual copyright strike problems here. But, that's ridiculous. So, we're just not doing music anymore. If I ever have the time and, f and ability to actually write my own ambient background music again, I'll do that. But, god damn, people, really? Anyways, let's get to Babylon 5. So, we've officially started Season 4, also known as basically the best season. Um, as usual... I'm not sure I'm ever going to have a lot to talk about, but oh my god, this it's just great upon great upon great. Um, I thought I'd give you a little bit of backstory on something first. Now, I don't know exactly when this happened, but while Season 1, 2, and 3 were doing okay, well, Babylon 5 never exactly had a fantastic run while it was live. It's definitely a Princess Bride situation where uh, I forgot to mute my phone. I've been doing that all over the place today. Sorry, I've been running around doing a lot of stuff today. A Princess Bride situation. Wasn't really well received when it came out. Massively well received later. And uh, I need to make a note of that real quick, actually. There we go. So they were basically told, yeah, this is your last season. Now, I don't know exactly when that happened, but I do know what happened. And JMS did pretty much what any real creator, you know, someone who really cares about their work would do. And he said he knuckled down and basically killed himself and his health in order to cram two seasons worth of story arcs, character developments, plot developments, and just all of this stuff, fleeced anything that was considered extraneous and squished it all down into a single season. And he sat down and wrote pretty much every single episode himself, which was a insane strain on the man. Uh, he has always basically been the executive producer of Babylon 5, but he became the, no really, I'm the guy in charge of everything, you want to do anything, you come to me guy when it came to season 4. Kind of like how Peter Jackson was over in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. To give you another parallel of someone who just had his fingers in every pot in the, in the creation of a work. Uh, Nicholas Meyer in Star Trek 2 is another example of someone like this. So, Season 4 feels a little rushed, but the weird thing is, in my opinion, it's actually better for it. Now, granted, we have the Season 5 problem, and we'll talk about that when we get there, but at the very least, here in Season 4, I feel like the increased tone helps. I know it wasn't intentional, and I, of course, wouldn't want to, to have the horrible stress that JMS went through to, to be on anyone, but Season 1 was very slow in its tone and its pace. Season 2 was very much build-up. Season 1 was establishment. Season 2 was build-up. Season 3 was a lot of payoff, but it was still a fairly methodical pace and tone. Season 4 feels like it's running. And I feel like that actually do is to the overall betterment of the show as a whole. Because it should feel like it's running, in my opinion, given what's happening and given the culmination of so many different events and all that's going to come to pass over the next season. I don't feel like I'm spoiling there because in this very first episode we already have significant uh, resultants coming with regards to the Shadows, the Vorlons, the Centauri, and Sheridan. Now, to talk about the episode proper, 
Uh, I, I like the intro. It's a little melodramatic. GMS's writing style tends to lean that way. I, I can't fault him for it. It's And Lord knows that... Uh, oh my god, I can't think of it. Katsulas does a really good job of managing to handle that kind of tone and that kind of you know flair. But uh, I like how it does two very important things in the intro. First, it, sh it highlights just how bad things are getting for Londo and how much he's effectively over the hump on his particular his, his first character arc, or I should say actually his second character arc, and now he is establishing his third character arc. And Ivanova, who is going through what she went through with President Santiago all those years ago, except worse in every way. Remember, what really got to Ivanova about that was that she was powerless to do anything about it. Here, it's the same situation, but it's not just the president. It's not just some person she owes loyalty to. It's her friend, her personal commanding officer, and someone she's known for many years, even before the show began. And it's the same situation, powerless to do anything about it. It's funny, because that brings me to my next point. As ever, they nail the politics quite well. Because if this was most fiction, the good guys saying we need to go help rescue this other good guy is the right thing to do. Because we know they're alive, and we know we need to go rescue them. You know, that's just fictional logic right there. But Babylon 5 is a little more complicated about that. And it makes it clear that the people opposed to that are not merely ob you know, obstinate bureaucrats, and the people in favor of it are not merely the good guys. Before I continue talking about this, I want to say how fascinating it is to see how Jakar has changed. Compare him to Season 1, just really quick, right now in your mind. Think about the obstructionist politician that he was usually portrayed as. Usually p perceived as if he was a petty villain, actually. And, as I've said many times, that was done on purpose to help elevate his eventual character development to this point. He would have been one of the people with the council arguing, why should we help him? Why should we do this? And now he's the one saying, we need to stay unified. We need to keep going. He is firmly, loyally in the camp of the Army of Light. It's fascinating to just pause for a moment and see how far he has come. His loyalty to Garibaldi in particular is also amusing and interesting to me. It's a nice little touch, and his desire to find him will be important, I think. But let's get back to the politics, shall we? And the itch I have right under my glasses. It's the weirdest place for an itch. First of all, keep in mind, these people are still not entirely certain you can actually win this war. They can gain victories, they can defeat the Shadows, but they cannot truly win a war against the Shadows. Everyone in the non-aligned world still has that overall mentality and perspective. I can understand that mentality perspective. It's how I think of the Borg, for instance, over in Star Trek. You can't beat the Borg. I mean, you can defeat a cube, you can win a battle, you can survive them, but you can't take on the war to the Borg Collective and win. That's not happening, right? Same idea. Whether it's true or not, that's more debatable. So I get that mentality. They have just been offered a tremendous victory. Now, the good guys, the Army of Light people, are saying, we need to push this, reunify our forces, and start striking back at the shadows. The politicians involved are saying, that's stupid! We need to use this time to build up our defenses, to be more ready for when the next battles come. We need to look to our own. Now, that's not as bad of an idea as it sounds. And with no single unifying individual capable of, gr of being diplomatic and charismatic enough to keep these people together, yeah, I could see them all saying that. It's not like they're immediately going back to fighting each other. It's not like they're immediately deciding to betray the group. It's just, we're going to pull back and we're going to build up. They did take quite a few losses in the war thus far, after all. Don't forget that. Now, the funny thing is, we know that that is the incorrect strategy, because we know the shadows are vulnerable. But we only know that because we have third-party information. But I love how they present these people as basically making the correct choice 
for the wrong reasons that actually is, is I'm saying this wrong the correct choice for the right reasons that is actually the wrong choice to make because if they push their advantage right now while the shadows are withdrawing while the shadows are danger in danger and wounded this would be the time to strike and of course the other side of the coin is the fact that several people in the army of light notably two of their primary leaders Delenn and Ivanova I'm just forgetting names all over the party. You notice I pause there. It's like, uh, lady face. <laughs> I'm really tired. Forgive me. Both of them are personally motivated to go find Sheridan. I mean, yeah, fighting the shadows, woo, but no, let's go get Sheridan. Let's go, let's go, let's go get Sheridan. Come on, come on. Why aren't you coming already? Come on, let's go. And so it makes the good guys seem less reasonable and the obstinate bad guy politicians seem more reasonable. Nice touch. I... <laughs> I really like the scene where Londo pretty much freely and openly badmouths the Emperor to one of his aides. Now, this isn't quite the same thing as badmouthing to his face, but... Later on, Londo actually feels sufficiently whatever, we'll get to that in a moment, to pretty much order Cartagia to get away from the window and try to physically move him back. He nearly gets killed for it by his bodyguards. <laughs> he also has no problem showing his horror, his shock at Cartagia, openly questioning him. I don't know how much you know about you know, royal politics, but... That can land you in a dungeon for the rest of your life. Both of those acts. I bring this up because Cartesia himself brings that up. When I have ascended, I will forgive you, but for now, I will try merely to forget. Emphasizing that Londo's life is very much nearly in danger for that slight. Now, whether I agree with that or not is irrelevant. That's royal politics, okay? I mention this because, in my mind, there's two possible reasons, and it could also be both as to why Londo feels confident enough to do this. Reason number one, he is very politically powerful and very politically connected right now. He has tremendous sway within the Centauri Republic. He is probably the second most powerful person in the Centauri Republic after the Emperor himself. And in some ways, he probably surpasses the Emperor. Or, option two, he doesn't give a damn anymore. He has gotten to the point where he is so jaded and so bitter, and is just in in this horrible situation that he knows is horrible, and he's just kind of let go and, and given up. He doesn't care at this point. Like I said, I kind of like the idea that it's both options mixed up there. So, there is this wonderful scene between Veer and Ivanova, where Fear basically says, yeah, no, Sheridan's dead. But then he immediately tries to comfort her, because Sheridan didn't die in vain, and that's true. Sheridan dealt the biggest blow to the shadows that has probably ever been dealt to the shadows. Not exactly an insignificant feat. Very important, very, literally the turning point of the whole war, right? And he keeps trying to comfort her. And what I love is that he's not doing it out of naivete. He understands, and when she just leaves, he lowers his head, acknowledging that he can't comfort her. But what I like even better is her reaction. When she hears about it, she just turns to leave. Ivanova has a great deal of pride about her, and she doesn't really trust herself to be open around most people. There are very, very few people that she will actually be herself around. And at that moment, Ivanova just wants to punch something while sobbing. And you can tell, it's all over her face. But so she, all she can do is try to keep that mask and keep the grief as contained as she can while she turns to leave. Doesn't even say anything. Can't even say anything. And then Veer stops her, and we have this wonderful camera angle of her face while he is basically comforting the back of her head as she crumbles and crumbles and crumbles. And you could just see on her face, she just wants to get out of there. She's not angry at Veer. There's no lashing out. She just can't deal with this. This is beyond her, beyond her capacity, beyond her ability. Poor Ivanova. Then we see Mr. Morden. Now, <laughs> I love the scene where he literally starts peeling 
bits of himself, bits of ash. Just kind of flicks it off. Morden is not the same. We'll see how this goes in the future. But his his interactions, his survival has clearly altered him significantly. And I mean mentally. Morden has always been a smug snake who's just on top of things, very calm, very inflappable. He has basically drifted into dementia here, but a very unique blend of it. Very wonderful writing by JMS. Because we actually see two forms of madness. Actually, excuse me, three forms of madness in this episode. It's probably the prevailing theme of this episode. You know, makes sense, given the hour of the wolf. Um, I'll talk, so this is the madness of Morden. He has bemused. He is resigned. And he, knowing that there's nothing he can do, has decided to just take um, t take enjoyment from the whole thing. To laugh it off, basically. <laughs> because after all, why is Cartesia on the throne? Oh, that's right. It's because Londo put him there. I mean, yeah, Rifa was involved too, but let's be clear. Londo put him there. But how did Londo have that power? Why is Londo the second, or first, most powerful member of the Centaurum Republic? Oh, that's right, because Mr. Morden put him there. And now he has to deal with Londo, and Londo has to deal with Cartesia, and God, isn't that just hilarious? And he just find, he looks at this whole thing with this perspective of, eh. you can tell he's a bit broken now. But he's not so broken as to forget his manipulative ways. Because he's like, oh, you'll do it because you're my friend. You know, you'll do it because this. But then he really hits the nail on the head. He says, you will do this. You will work with us. And you will do what we say as our liaison to the Centauri Republic. Because you know exactly what any lesser man would do in your position. He blackmails him with his own sense of duty and responsibility. Because if you don't play ball, someone else will. And oh, it'll be a lot worse if it's someone else. And you know that. He hits Londo right where it hurts. And note that that severity, the, the sincere impact of that is what drives Londo to start pushing for this eventual conspiracy. I mean, yeah, there's the shadows showing up, but he knew that was coming. He's seen it, after all. Note, I'm not going to comment on the production variances between the vision and the reality. Let's just move on from that. <laughs> I mean, it's been a couple of years since they'd shot that. You know, There's only so much you can do with a TV show. But uh, I do very much like everything about him reaching out to Veer. First of all, Veer is such a logical choice. He is someone who has had power and has used it for good. You know, with morality, with ethics. Londo even flat out says it. When you become powerful, you either... You don't have friends anymore. You have people who want to use you and people you want to use. And somehow, Veer, you have slid between those cracks. It's a great speech. But it's more powerful for the fact that Londo flat out admits to his face. I believe this is the first time he flat out says this openly. You are my friend. Now... Londo and Veer have been close for some time. And it's very obvious Londo has cared about Veer for some time. But for him to openly admit it, for him to drop pretenses, to drop the whole, you know, politician mask, and just flat out say, no, Veer, you're my friend and I need you on this one. That, more than anything else, shows just how serious Londo is taking this. This is no longer a game. This is no longer politics. This is no longer part of the norm. This has to be dealt with now. And I like that because I've pointed out a few times across the show, every now and again, Londo drops the facade. He rarely does it. But every now and again, he does it. And when he does, you see a little bit of the real Londo under there. And that's what he does here. He just is like, nope, we're dealing with this. Sorry, I just started going off there. I don't need my notes for most of Babylon 5. I know this show so well, but let me check. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, there's a nice little bit. So let's talk about the second form of madness in this episode. Cartesia. The obvious form of madness. Now, what's funny... 
when I first saw this episode, I thought, well, hang on, why is why do they keep saying Cartesia is a madman? I mean, yeah, he's got... Maybe I'm just biased because I've played Final Fantasy games before, but some villain who says, oh, I shall be ascended to godhood, is just kind of normal to me, right? But then they inserted one very subtle thing that I've never caught before, and I freely admit this. I caught this this time, I was like, oh, that's brilliant. I've mentioned this before, all throughout the entire series thus far. Every time someone has either been in proximity to, or seen, or heard a shadow vessel. Their reaction is fear and nightmare and screaming. And I've actually talked about this before in my theories as to why it is. But everyone's reaction to it has been as if it's some horrific, nightmarish thing. Okay? That's been consistent the whole series. What does Cartesia do when he sees the shadows? Look! Look! They're coming! Oh! Oh! He's excited. He's exuberant. He's peeking out the window like a little child. Look, look, shadow vessels. And when that sunk in, I was just like, oh my god, what is wrong with that man? Huh, holy crap. How diseased do you have to be mentally to greet something like that with excited little giggles? By the way, props to the actor who plays Cartesia. He does a really good job of not going too far over the top and still maintaining the, you know, uh, uh, the Nero approach, you know, Emperor Nero thing, <laughs> which he is, uh, I forget if it's him or JMS. I remember reading about this uh, in JMS Speaks about Emperor Nero being a very clear and obvious inspiration for Emperor Cartesia. So he's the second form of madness. Fairly obvious. There's just literally something wrong with him. He has invited all these shadows to elevate himself to godhood. And there's this beautiful scene right after that, which, just in case you didn't get it, it's, it's poetry. Forgive me. Because it is the problem with the Centauri Republic. We have seen so many sides of the Centauri this whole series, and a lot of them have been fairly negative, but not all of them. What we see is a flawed organization that kind of has been limbering on and is very much stuck in the past. And now we see, in case we've never figured it out before, why that is. Because the entire Centauri Republic has been built around one single concept, avoiding responsibility. Their entire system of the purple, of the politics, of the, of the labyrinthine based power bases and this person misinforming this person, misinforming this person. All of that exists to remove the individual from responsibility, to put responsibility on the house, on the seat, on the centaurum, on the emperor. But none of these are individuals, none of these are people putting it as far away from the people as possible. And it's so obvious that these people are used to not having to take responsibility for things. It's one of the things that makes Londo so unusual amongst his people. And he's not the only one. There have been other Centauri who understand this concept. But there's that great scene where the minister, I forget his name, he's been in the show before, is talking to Londo and he says, don't worry, it'll all work out in the end. And you're not even sure if he believes it himself, but that's what he says because... That's what they've always said. It's not his fault. It's not his responsibility. It's not Londo's. It's nobody's responsibility, actually. By design, it is a fluid government. I forget what the proper, you know, literal term is for that. There is a term for that type of government. Uh, you, you can see aspects of it, bits and pieces of it in real life, in many different real life governments. But the idea is responsibility for actions is spread out amongst multiple people so no individual has power but as a consequence no individual has blame either so you don't have to take responsibility for something because you didn't do this right there's one other little side plot in this episode where they go and they, uh, you know, they, it's about Ulkesh, basically, and the eye. So Ulkesh, you know, Delenn reaches out to Ulkesh, and you can tell how far Delenn has come. Again, like the Jakar thing earlier and the like the Londo thing, Delenn does not give a crap about the fact that she's basically bad-mouthing a Vorlon ambassador to his face, 
Regardless of politics, that's a frickin' Vorlon, but she is still willing to stand up to him on this matter. And Ulkesh basically says, no, nah, go away, I don't care. Y y you have lost all respect for you. Why do I care about respect? Ulkesh's perspective is so obvious. It's even hammered in in the next scene we see where he is giving a bit of himself to Lita. Because she says something along the lines of, it's different, you know, it's darker. But rather than accusing him, she says, are you okay? To which he says, nah, it's fine. It's so obvious that Kosh had been kind and gentle because of caring, right? Because he actually gave a damn. Why would a Vorlon, excuse me, why would Olkesh give a damn? You're just an individual. You are a tool, and until you are no longer of use, then shrug. It's not that hard of a mindset to understand. Now, there are some people who take good care of their tools. That's called stewardship. However, I bet you yourself, and Lord knows I've done this too, occasionally have just been like, eh, just toss the hammer in the bag. Because it's just a hammer. You don't need to take care of it. And that complete negligence is exactly how Olkesh treats those around him. I once again postulate that Olkesh is a more typical Vorlon than Kosh was, especially because of interactions like this. And then we see the third type of madness. Because the third type of madness is what possesses Delenn and, uh, I forgot her name again, Ivanova, and to an extent Lita. They take one of the best ships in the fleet into a place that is immeasurably dangerous. They nearly died, too, Let's be, or worse, actually. Just to go and hope, against hope, that Sheridan was there and that Sheridan was alive. That is the third type of madness. The madness of grief. The madness of disbelief. The madness of, no, no, I, I can't, it won't. It, denial. They are willing to argue, try to try to lead an aligned coalition. They are willing to go against the Vorlons. They're willing to go behind people's back and go to an extremely dangerous place undermanned in a, in a one in a billion chance, just on the off chance that he might be there because of that madness of denial. And then they encounter the Eye. This is actually the second and last, if I'm not mistaken, time we ever see the Eye. And it just starts crawling all over their brains. And it's kind of messed up what happens there. And then I'm reminded of why Lanier is awesome. He flat out says it. I had programmed a thing in so that in case I do not hit that button once every two minutes, we poured a course the hell out of here. That's brilliant. Because if they t started taking damage or if he was injured or if something started mentally affecting him like it did... The ship just turns around and starts to leave. Brilliant. Love that. And it reminds me of something I talked about from my perspective recently. I think you'll see it in a week or two in Voyager. In Voyager, I make a point of pointing out when an episode is smart because it's kind of unusual for Voyager to be smart. They do it, and it's great when they do it. But this kind of stuff, that's being smart. There's a lot of things in this episode that are very smart. They don't lay everything out for you. They let you pick up the pieces for yourself, and the characters behave intelligently and, and, take, and behave as if they are themselves. It's brilliant. I love it. And I cannot wait for the rest of Season 4. I'll see you around, guys.